as we came in this morning, I saw and I heard and I joined in seeing our great Savior. And I think I want to talk this morning about our great Savior. John Jowett, who was minister in Cars Lane Church in England and later in Fifth Avenue Church, said, that no sermon ought to be preached until you can state it in a sentence. And the purpose of this sermon is to lift up the greatness and the grandeur of our great Savior. In order to secure from us a fitting reference, reverence and a due response. That's what it's all about. Now let me read these words from Paul's letter to the church which met in the city of Philippi at the second chapter beginning at the fifth verse. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also have highly exalted him yes. and given him a name which is above every name yes. that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow yes. of things in heaven and things on earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Yes. This Paul, this massive intellect, one of the great minds of all of these 20 centuries, sends his soaring intellect and his blazing heart out into the secret regions where he catches a glimpse of the secret transactions of the Trinity and he eavesdrops upon the strategy of the skies and out of that he reports to us that Christ enjoyed by right a place of unequaled and surely unexcelled honor in the councils of eternity. He who knew the prayers of angels gave it up, did not have to. Thought it not robbery, I have translated that to mean, don't tell your people at Princeton this, doctor, huh? uh, to, to translate it that to mean he thought it not taking too much for granted to be equal with God. And he gave it up. He exchanged the adulation of heavenly creatures for the derision of the earth. He traded the praise of angels for the curses of men and left, this is the gospel in miniature. This is, uh, this, this is salvation history in two or three sentences. This is what it's all about. This is the living heart, the throbbing core 
of the gospel. Everything else is tributary and derivative, but this is at the throbbing center of what our faith is all about. That he gave up his hometown in glory and became a stranger in the earth where he could not equal even the lairs of foxes and birds. Jesus, in our interest, left a natural estate of preeminence and came here to this low land of sorrow to be mocked and ridiculed. He, he took upon himself the form of a servant in our behalf, in our interest, came here to this place, became time trapped, death eligible, pain capable. for you. And Paul sums it up by saying he humbled himself. And then he says to us, let this mind be in you. How difficult we find it to humble ourselves. He who did not need to humble himself had no reason to humble himself did we who have every reason to humble ourselves will not. When somebody commented to Winston Churchill about his political opponent, Clement Attlee, and said, Mr. Attlee is a humble man, Churchill, with his sharp, accurate tongue, replied, Mr. Attlee has much to be humble about. Well, all of us, all of you, have all of us have much to be humble about. Charles Spurgeon once said that a man said something about me that was very unkind. He said it because he did not know me. If he had known me, he could have said something far worse. But how difficult we find it to humble ourselves. Our nation would be so much farther along if we had been willing to admit our great persisting perennial fault of race. A man observing the Constitutional Convention named Chapman said that this whole matter of racism then in the form of human slavery lay coiled like a sleeping serpent under the table of the Constitutional Convention. It has haunted us all through our history. By now, we should have put this specter behind us, this ghost, this, this ominous, threatening, oppressing ghost, should have long since been laid forever. But we is not because we have not been willing to admit it and to confess our sins. I know what you're facing in Detroit. Let me tell you this. We have come to the place where our whole judicial system is under grave threat. We were talking about this last night. In Los Angeles, it was established that we may have come to the place where whites will not convict whites. In Brooklyn the other day, with uh, evidence, at least on the part of those who complained about it, apparently on the side of conviction, a black jury refused to convict a black. You will be facing it shortly, and whichever way it goes, the matter of race will be prominent. Now, when you add to this the ingredient that the Supreme Court has now decided that the exclusionary uh, practice of attorneys on the basis of race of barring people from juries can no longer be done, 
And you get the situation where blacks cannot commit blacks and whites will not convict whites. The whole fabric of the judicial system is torn to pieces. Did you hear me? And so race has once again come to the fore to threaten our entire system of justice, which we knew was suspect all along, but which now is placarded and emblazoned before the world. But we would not humble ourselves. The bigotry in our country. I've heard, and I've heard since I've been here, that one death is the same as another. That is not true. I lay awake last night pondering that the death of Jesus and the death of Judas were not the same death. Martin King martyred in Memphis is not the same thing as a Martin King murdered for rape and incest and murder. There is a difference in deaths. If we would but humble ourselves. And in our own community, I'm greatly impressed by the attention which is now being paid to the memory of Malcolm X, whom I knew and with whom I carried on conversations. This is not hearsay. I knew his strengths and I knew his weaknesses. I'm impressed at the attention. But did you know that almost all of the ex-caps and ex-sweatshirts are made by people to whom Malcolm did not speak particularly. And another thing, if we in our African American community could humble ourselves to recognize our great interior fissures and fractures, in 1967, I guess it was, the Kerner Commission issued a report saying that there are two Americas, one white, one black. We have not admitted it, but there are two black Americas. One integrationist, upwardly mobile, acquisitive, hopeful, the other sullen, angry, having contracted out of the normal transactions of life. You may not admit it, but they are on your street corners and they are in your parks in Detroit as they are in my borough of Brooklyn. Two black Americas. And beyond that, what we have not been willing to admit is that there is, I dare not only, I dare to say it, not only mutual contempt, but hatred. And we will never heal the breach until we humbly recognize the chasm. He humbled himself. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus, and became obedient unto the cross. Now, death may not be beautiful, but we all have a right to some dignity as we come to the end. But in your name and in my name, he forfeited that dignity. And as was read in our scripture lesson this morning, underneath that darkening sky, on that one Friday in all of history that saw night twice, he died. In your interest and in mine. Died not in the dignity of privacy, but died a public spectacle yes. midst the flies and the curses and the rattling dice. Yes. He died yes. with no tender hand to mock the death dew from his brow. 
and with no tender words to soothe his spirit as he took flight to realms unknown for you and for me he died a public shame is there any man or woman here so brutish that he or she can look upon that death in our behalf and walk away indifferent and untouched is there any child any boy or any girl so stony of heart that its spirit or her spirit is not melted by the dying savior was it for crimes that i had done he groaned upon the tree amazing pity grace unknown and love beyond degree well might the sun in darkness hide and shut his glories in when christ the mighty maker died 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 for man the creature's sin and because he did our great savior we have a hope we poor dying men and women we poor disappearing mortals have a hope i left the golf course in brooklyn last tuesday it was to me that almost melancholy time of evening when darkness has about uh, superseded day and the chill of evening was in the air a man came along drinking a cup of coffee he had a little boy the little boy had a bicycle with the two little supporting wheels to keep him from becoming unbalanced the man said to me the boy was only 3 we got to talking i said that's your grandson and he said to me why you think i'm too old to be the father and well i said to him that when i got to be 65 or 62 it bothered me when people asked me are you a citizen, senior citizen now they don't even ask but he and i talked and he said my wife died about 6 months ago cancer a cloud a shadow crossed his countenance there in the, in the gathering gloaming she was in the hospital 3 weeks he said i said well you have your grandchild he said no they are moving to california 2 weeks from now sacramento and he said i won't have anybody but my dog left he did not know me but he did know me i did not know him but i did know him for we are all bound in the bundle of living and dying all of us here are in Canada see for sorrow for life is a continuing apprenticeship to grief and the dearest romantic tie represented our ties represented in this congregation this morning are under the shadow of death and we have no hope as he walked off into the darkness got in his car honked his horn disappeared in the traffic of flatbush avenue and i thought of one verse thou the spring of all my comfort more than friend or life to me whom have i on earth beside thee whom in heaven but the savior savior do not pass me by what other hope do we have except in jesus what other hope do we have we who are poor disappearing creatures 
the places that know us now will soon know us no more. None but him. Thank God for the gospel. He has been my friend so long. He has led my feet, guided me, protected me. I love to talk about him. He has been my brother, my bridge, my hope, my strength, my light, my life, my peace. I love to talk about him. Years ago, I preached the first time across the Commonwealth of Australia. On a Sunday morning in Tasmania, I preached the sermon was carried by radio across the Commonwealth. When I got to Melbourne, I received a letter through the people of the Baptist Union who had sponsored my coming from a woman who I tried to talk about the glory and greatness of our Savior. And she wrote some words which I try now to recall. She said, he was uh, born contrary to the laws of birth and died triumphant over the laws of death. He was born in poverty, but wise men brought their riches, laid them at his feet. He was cradled in another's crib, sailed on another's boat, rode on another's animal, supped in another's upper room, was laid in another's tomb, but to him belong the unsearchable riches of glory. The earth is his, and the fullness thereof, and the cattle on a thousand hills are all his. He never wrote but once, and that in the disappearing sand of the temple. But all of the libraries of the world cannot contain the books that have been written about him. We know of one instance only in which he sang a hymn. But the most creative geniuses of melody have brought their purest gifts and laid them reverently at his feet. Herod, as a, as a baby, he frightened the king. As a child, he perplexed the elders and doctors. As a man, he made the sea be still. And boisterous waves lie down upon the bosom of his gentle command. Sin could not resist him. Satan could not seduce him. Sinners could not withstand him. Death could not destroy him. And the grave could not hold him. I love to talk about my Savior. I love to honor him. He is a friend in loneliness. He is strength in weakness. He is health in sickness. He is wholeness when we are wounded. He is the widow's pension. He is the prisoner's pardon. He is the exile's recall to citizenship. He is the orphan's adoption. I love, I love, I love to talk about him. Jesus, an anthem in one word, an oratorio in two syllables. Jesus, 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 my Lord. I know his name.